Perfecto. Muy buenas tardes, sean todos bienvenidos a este foro sobre la estrategia Cero COVID, donde analizaremos la evidencia de la estrategia Cero COVID y cómo podemos implementarla en, en nuestros países. Mi nombre es Tomás Gutiérrez y estoy de anfitrión el día de hoy. Tenemos un panel eh, preparado para ustedes. Muchísimas gracias por unirse. Está con nosotros eh, el doctor Yanir Baryam, el presidente, quien es presidente del de, eh, Instituto de Sistemas Complejos de Nueva Inglaterra y también fundador de eh, la iniciativa de endcoronavirus.org. Eh, también tenemos en el, el día de hoy al doctor Miguel Lombera, eh, quien es eh, el vicepresidente de la Alianza de Asociaciones de Salud Pública de las Américas. Eh, está con nosotros también Ana Stewart, directora científica del Instituto Interamericano para la Investigación del Cambio Global. Y eh, también está con nosotros en el panel de hoy eh, Irene Torres, eh, directora de la Fundación Octaedro. Muchísimas gracias a todos por unirse el día de hoy. Eh, le voy a ceder primero la palabra a eh, el doctor eh, Miguel Lombera para que nos dé unas palabras de bienvenida de parte de la Alianza de Asociaciones de Salud Pública de las Américas. Muchas gracias, Tomás. Muy buenas tardes tengan todas y todos ustedes. Es un privilegio para nosotros este, poder dar estas palabras y en nombre del de doctor Alcides Ochoa, que es el presidente de la Alianza de Asociaciones Públicas eh, de, de, para la Salud Pública de las Américas. Eh, y también aprovecho eh, este, también da, dar la bienvenida a nombre de la Federación Mundial de Asociaciones de, Sel de Salud Pública, quien su presidente es Luis Eugenio eh, eh, de Brasil, eh, me, me da mucho gusto, mucho placer poder eh, saludarlos. Me parece esta iniciativa que eh, pues se ha venido generando eh, de estrategia eh, cero COVID, COVID cero, eh, eh, me parece que es fundamental. Eh, estamos viviendo una serie de, de, de movimientos en el mundo, ustedes lo conocen muy bien, eh, en algunos países en los que ya la tercera ola prácticamente ha cobrado una gran cantidad de casos y de funciones, eh, y por otro lado, en países en donde aparentemente está reduciéndose los casos y que eh, pareciera que va hacia abajo, pero eh, que han empezado a dar algunos, algunos eh, sustos, algunos problemas también. Eh, conocen la información, eh, ya con más de 181 millones de, de casos acumulados en, en el año, casi 4 millones de defunciones, una letalidad de 2.17 en el mundo, eh, pero con grandes mosaicos en, 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 también en el mundo, eh, en donde eh, países como el mío, eh, y me apena decirlo, que si bien tenemos, eh, eh, ocupamos el lugar número 12, eh, con 2.5 millones de casos y 232 mil defunciones, tenemos una letalidad muy alta del 9.3, ya después eh, podemos platicar sobre sus causas y consecuencias, este, pero... Eh, y países como, como la India, que si bien tiene casi 30, más de 30 millones de casos, con una letalidad de 1.3. Entonces, me parece que eh, esta mesa que, que gentilmente han, se, se ha establecido, se ha coordinado, pues es un privilegio el poder contar con, con Janet Bayan, con eh, Anne Stewart, con Ivonne Torres, Irene Torres, perdón. Eh, me parece que es una, una ocasión fundamental para poder seguir eh, y poder buscar las mejores estrategias para poder llegar a una eh, posibilidad de reducir el número de casos de COVID eh, con estrategia cero COVID. Muchas gracias. Eh, Tomás, no quisiera hacer más uso de la palabra. Gracias a todos. Muchísimas gracias, Miguel. Gracias por estar presente hoy en este evento. Y ahora cedo la palabra a Ana Stewart, quien es directora científica del Instituto Interamericano para la Investigación del Cambio Global. Adelante, Ana. Gracias, Tomás. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. I'm going to switch to English. So, as we'll hear in this panel today, there is an urgent need for science, policy, knowledge, and tools to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a tremendous challenge that we face collectively 
And certainly this pandemic is occurring in the broader context of social and ecological crises, such as the climate crisis and vast, vast inequalities, especially in across the Americas. So these global crises by definition transcend national boundaries and effective interventions require a coordinated multinational response. Countries in the region are searching for meaningful strategies that reflect their local realities and needs. And certainly this search for solutions is more urgent than ever in the context of the pandemic. I am here on behalf of the II, the uh, Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. And we are an intergovernmental organization that was established almost 30 years ago by countries across the Americas who came together to address these challenges. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to support this important discussion and look forward to hearing from the panelists. And uh, again, the II is here to serve our member nations at, to come to bring information together, the science policy interface. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Tomas. Um, so let's go back for a minute to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the initial phase. Um, at that time, uh, the outbreak started, of course, in China. But just a few weeks, it's hard to imagine that it only took a few weeks, but only a few weeks later, there, were, there was no COVID cases in China except for imported cases. And, and aside from very short time localized outbreaks, there haven't been cases in China since then. And the situation in China continues till today to be one where um, the people are living a, an essentially normal life within China. They go to work, they go to families, they are, um, the economy is, uh, has uh, improved uh, uh, so that there is economic growth this year uh, by significant uh, amount. Now, after China uh, was able to suppress the outbreak there, uh, South Korea also demonstrated that it was possible to dramatically suppress the outbreak. Uh, and then New Zealand um, uh, had a made a decision. Uh, Michael Baker, a scientist there, was asked by the government, what should we do? And he said, there are two choices. One is the choice of um, mitigation, and the other one is the choice of elimination. Uh, and the government said, hey, elimination sounds better. Well, let's do it. They executed on the plan. Uh, and they've lived essentially in a normal existence since, eliminating the virus, aside from, again, short time localized responses to outbreaks that have been due to a few imported cases. Uh, they've maintained an elimination uh, uh, context. And Australia, of course, as we all know, was also able to achieve it. They had a pretty significant outbreak in Victoria in one of the states. Uh, and then uh, they uh, decided that they were going to um, uh, go for a very strong suppression with a goal of elimination. There were scientists, a multidisciplinary group of scientists that did modeling uh, that identified the threshold at which elimination would be achieved as being five cases in Victoria, which is uh, in a population of about 5 million, so about one case per million as a threshold for achieving elimination. And they achieve the five cases per million at, in the same week that they projected that that would happen. And then they went on to achieve elimination and they had uh, no cases of domestic transmission in Victoria uh, as a result of that elimination approach. Uh, there were other states in Australia that since then had small outbreaks, and recently there was uh, there are some outbreaks, and I want to talk about them in a moment. But for many months in Australia, uh, there were no cases, uh, except for very short time localized outbreaks, uh, during which there was 
strong action taken of localized lockdowns um, and they returned to elimination. Uh, there are other countries that have done similarly. And one of the uh, uh, countries uh, is Vietnam, another one is Thailand, another country is um, uh, um, uh, Singapore has, has maintained a, a very low level of cases along with South Korea. They've kind of uh, had uh, over time more cases than uh, some of the other places that I've mentioned, but it's been an extremely low number of cases overall compared to other parts of the world. It's also worth pointing out that the eastern part of Canada called Atlantic Canada, consisting of four provinces, has also uh, achieved elimination. And again, they had some localized outbreaks and they maintain travel among the four provinces for extended periods of time. Uh, but the province that's next door, Quebec, uh, did not achieve elimination and was much more like many other parts of the world where the cases went up. Now, once the cases went up in other parts of the world, the countries got trapped in what we might call yo-yo lockdowns. So the cases went up, People tried to ignore them, but they got to a level where it was impossible to ignore them. Hospitals filled, many people died, and eventually there was a decision that um, something had to be done. And then things shut down, the, um, uh, there were lockdowns, there were restrictions on mobility, and then cases went down. And once cases went down uh, below a certain level, People decided, okay, now it's time to go up and they went up and they went down and they went up and they went down. So what's the problem? Why did some places achieve elimination and some places didn't? And in fact, I think it's really mostly due to the belief in the possibility of elimination. And this is very hard to, um, to, to digest, but in much of the world, the idea of elimination has not been part of the policy dialogue, unlike in New Zealand. And, and again, Australia was kind of a marginal case where they talked about strong suppression with a goal of elimination without saying that they were actually going to achieve elimination. But in the places that they had an objective of elimination, um, in essentially all of the places that I know where they actually target elimination, uh, they were successful in achieving it. Whereas in other parts of the world, the narrative, and, and again, part of this is a scientific narrative that we should deconstruct. Why do many scientists still today think that elimination is simply not possible? And I think that the answer lies in, first of all, in lack of experience. In the current recent decades, much of the Western world doesn't have experience with performing elimination. And the reason is twofold. First of all, outbreaks like Ebola and like SARS, and SARS again is the most similar disease to uh, the current uh, pandemic, um, uh, experienced the battle of achieving elimination. Um, the other reason is that so, so the place times where elimination was achieved in much of the West were older. I mean, measles is a disease where we've achieved elimination in much of the world. Um, there is some challenge to that elimination now in the UK and other places due to relaxation of efforts to achieve elimination. But elimination has been achieved in multiple cases. And I personally was involved also at the policy level and community uh, engagement efforts and community empowerment effort in West Africa and the Congo. And it was, elimination was achieved. And I think it's important to mention that at the time of the West African outbreak, much of the modeling and much of the uh, epidemiological community, including my, in the public health community, was clearly stating that it was definitely going to happen that there were going to be millions of deaths due to Ebola in West Africa. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were 11,310 deaths due to Ebola in West Africa. Uh, and the mechanism by which it was achieved is communities took ownership of their own health and 
members of the community went door to door, identifying cases early, isolating them, and stopping the transmission of cases in the communities, even with about you know, 50% compliance, they were able to achieve elimination in West Africa as a result of those actions. And, and this is actually what my recommendations at the time were about. Now, it turns out that my recommendations were not the reason that they did it. They did it because they understood intuitively that that was the right thing to do to stop transmission. But the reason that I was recommending at the time is that you can do an analysis, a mathematical analysis of pandemic dynamics. And what you realize is that there are just a few control parameters. Basically, there are the things that you have that enable you to, to decide what is happening with a pandemic. It's like driving a car. So when you drive a car, there are lots of things that you can look at, right? Doors open and close, the trunk opens and close, the wheels are round. But if you want to know what controls the behavior of the car, then there are basically only a few things. There is the steering wheel, the gas and the brakes, and the gear shift. And once you know what that is, you can control a car. And if you know that, then you know what can be done. And in the context of, of, of a pandemic, my background in complexity science and mathematics that's beyond calculus and statistics points to what are the control variables. And the control variables are the R value, which is very clear, but also travel restrictions, and also the discreteness of the number of cases. And that's super important because if you get close to zero, then you count the cases. Like I said, in Australia, if there are five cases in Victoria, you can achieve elimination. And, and, and basically one case per million is the threshold at which contact tracing is sufficient by itself to sustain a zero COVID condition. Uh, and, and that's what enables elimination to be possible. And the travel restrictions is essential because it stops importing of cases. Now, travel restrictions have been used in many parts of the world, and including in, in, in South America. Us, Argentina used them and restricted the pandemic uh, for an extended period of time to only parts of the country. Um, uh, particularly to um, the, the capital city. But the point is that the, the ability to restrict travel enables you to confine the outbreak. And in the context of an elimination strategy, even from a large number of cases, the trick is to get the cases down and then to progressively confine the outbreak geographically because that enables you to constantly progress forward rather than going forward and back and forward and back as you recede uh, the outbreak in places that you've already achieved elimination. So by using travel restrictions on a temporary basis, you can identify what we call green zones, areas where the disease is not present. Um, in those areas, you can restore normal activity, which is super important, both of course, for people to do normal activities, but also for the ability to restore economic activity. And once this strategy is understood, we realize that there are these two false narratives that have really uh, pervasive, been pervasive during this outbreak. The first one is the one that I mentioned that you can't do it but we know that we can, it's been done. The second is that there is a balance that has to be achieved between economic factors and health factors. And understanding that that's not the case is really key. Now, if you accept that the disease is going to be around, um, then it's difficult to understand why uh, there isn't such a trade-off. But in fact, if you understand the elimination process, you realize that what you're doing is investing. You're eliminating the virus in an area so that economic activity can be normal 
And that allows economic activity to be effective, successful, and of course, much better than what's been happening in, in, in much of the Americas, uh, with perhaps a few exceptions, including Atlantic Canada. Now, the, so, so if we go back to this basic idea of the trade-off, politicians are often involved in compromise. And the challenge with an elimination strategy is that you can't compromise on it. You can't say, well, let's do a little bit of elimination, not elimination. And so when politicians say, well, you say this and you say this, so I'll do something in between, it'll be better, that just doesn't work. In economics, this is called convexity. The point is that the right solution is at the boundary and that's the boundary of elimination. So the basic idea is that if you uh, decide, if you make a decision to achieve elimination, then you actually achieve the best economic conditions. And if you look at what happened in Australia, New Zealand, and in China, it's quite obvious that that's the case. But one has to talk with people who are involved in economics about the idea of investment in order to achieve elimination, because over the short time, there is a sacrifice of economic activity, but elimination enables it to restore um, the uh, economic activity and the opportunity for economic growth. Now, so far, I've really talked about everything that's happened until about three, four months ago in much of the world. Since then, what has happened? What's happened is there's vaccinations, the vaccinations are being used to themselves suppress some of the transmission. And the vaccines are quite effective with a reduction of transmission um, in the best vaccines of about tenfold to 20 fold. So there's five to 10% breakthrough cases. Um, and those breakthrough cases um, are important for transmission. But if we have a transmission of a factor of about five, and then we reduce transmission by a factor of 10, then we can achieve elimination by vaccines if we vaccinate 100% of the population, which of course is not what happens. So then what do we do? Well, the answer is if we combine vaccines with the other methods, the methods of preventing transmission by using masks, by social distancing, and by ultimately by lockdowns, then we can achieve a dramatic reduction of cases and go to elimination. Now, that would be if we, if we just had the vaccines as a major development, but of course there's another development, which is the variants, and the variants have accelerated transmission. So the UK variant was faster in transmission, more lethal, um, and affected children more. And then of course we progressed recently until the Delta variant uh, from India, and the uh, couple of variants from Brazil have become dominant in various parts of the world, with it seems the Indian variant becoming the most uh, transmissible uh, and uh, the most vaccine evading, uh, and therefore it provides it with advantages in terms of uh, achieving more cases. Now, all of this battle between you know, the changes in vaccination, which are an effective instrument of prevention of transmission, and the variants that are fighting back against our ability to stop transmission, uh, as well as just generally increasing transmission, uh, where are we left with? And the answer is, well, we still have countries that are either almost at or, or basically at the threshold of elimination. So there are several different strategies that are now in place. Israel with a high vaccination level of about 60% in the population, 80% in the adult population, um, has reached recently a level of half a case per million. Okay, five cases per day in Israel, uh, which is a country of nine, 10 million people. So they were at the threshold of elimination and then they allowed cases to import. Delta variant cases came in. They actually have quite strong travel restrictions, but they weren't quite strong enough. The Delta variant being highly transmissible uh, and uh, in particular 
there were children outbreaks in schools that were going on um, that uh, allowed the recent outbreaks. By the way, there are a lot of people in Israel, as if I remember the number correctly, about 40% are people who are vaccinated, are adults that are vaccinated. So now we go to other cases. In much of Eastern Europe, Czechia, Poland, um, other Balkan countries, the cases are now down to only a few cases per million. How did they get there? And interestingly enough, it's kind of almost by accident, you would say. I don't know that they were really targeting elimination. Uh, and they're not behaving as if they want elimination. But what happened is that because of the variants, they implemented stronger uh, restrictions at some point during the past uh, few months. Uh, and they also ramped up vaccination, not as nearly as high as Israel. It was up at 15% fully vaccinated, about 30% a partially vaccinated in, say, Poland. Um, and so with the vaccination, there was suppression of transmission and with the measures that they were taking, uh, which were partial lockdowns in nature, the cases went down and down and down until they got to a level of about a few cases per million. So we see that that's another strategy where we have more of a balance uh, between the vaccination and the other parts of the strategy so we can get down to very low cases. Now they could get to elimination. The thing that's missing again is they have to have some travel restrictions. And now we have Poland imposing some travel restrictions, but again, is it going to be enough to stop the Delta variant is very unlikely. You have to take the travel restrictions seriously in order to get there. Now, if they did, well, Poland could be at elimination. And what would happen then? Everyone in Europe would be kind of surprised and maybe other countries would go to elimination too. We also have other countries that are actually still doing elimination the old way. So India with the Indian variant, of course, had a horrendous outbreak where there was tremendously overflowing hospitals. Now they haven't vaccinated a substantial fraction of the population yet, but the cases are way down. In fact, in multiple states in India, with the exception of four states, they're basically at elimination. One state, Uttar Pradesh, uh, which has about 225 million people that live there, many of them in villages, but there are major urban areas um, there too, and then uh, are down at less than one case per million. And they are intent actually on achieving elimination. They have a my village zero COVID uh, policy now. And we have Delhi, which is down very close to elimination, which is one of the major metropolitan areas of the world. And uh, of course, Delhi has major slums, uh, major uh, places of high density population. And India has demonstrated that even in super high density areas, it's possible to achieve elimination. So what do we learn from this? Well, the answer is we have the opportunity, but the communication about the science and the clarity about the opportunity has to start with the understanding that elimination has been shown to be possible in other diseases, as well as in COVID. It has been shown to be possible in countries that are islands, which is often pointed to, but also in countries that are surely not islands. Uh, and the fact that we can get to near zero in much of India uh, is a demonstration of that opportunity. And then we have to communicate what elimination looks like. It doesn't mean that there are zero cases all the time. There are cases that are imported that should be quarantined. Um, there are cases so on that um, may have localized outbreaks, but will be eliminated. But the way to think about it is that I don't know any country in the world that doesn't have a zero fire policy. If there's a fire, you put it out. You don't let it burn from house to house to house. And, and that's really how the communication about the science should become clarified. And again, a lot of this confusion revolves around economics. And having 
not only the, um, the um, public health community communicate about the opportunity to elimination, but having the business community explain that it's the best thing for business if elimination is achieved, as is manifest in the countries that have achieved elimination. And today, that's something that many businesses don't understand. But the earliest and strongest, one of the earliest influences that I had over the coronavirus outbreak was in Australia when I spoke with a business community there. And they're the ones that took a letter with my explanation of how to achieve elimination to the government, to the federal government in Australia. And they strengthened their policies of restrictions to prevent transmission as a result of that communication. It surely wasn't the only thing that happened that was responsible for their success, but it was one of the key pieces of communication that enabled the government to act because they heard from the business community that this is what they wanted. So I think I should stop there and allow for questions. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Yanir. Uh, ahora, eh, otros miembros del panel, Irene y Miguel, Ana, está abierto el micrófono. Ahora pueden abrir sus micrófonos para compartirnos comentarios iniciales. Las damas, por favor, primero, son tan amables. Gracias, Irene. por favor, Irene. Gracias, Ana. Eh, nuevamente, gracias a las personas que se han conectado por diferentes vías. Eh, el día de hoy nos reunimos para discutir sobre todo las evidencias que existen sobre la posible consecución de COVID-0. Yanir Baryam nos ha explicado diferentes casos en países con diferentes perfiles densidad poblacional, regiones del mundo eh, y sobre todo el efecto del de acercamiento de los gobiernos en ciertos casos con el sector privado a la búsqueda de COVID-0. Eh, el Instituto Interamericano de Investigación en Cambio Global sobre todo quiere poner a disposición de la comunidad de tomadores de decisiones eh, de personas que diseñan políticas públicas la evidencia para continuar discutiendo, debatiendo eh, con las autoridades científicas de cada país, con los expertos científicos que han continuado trabajando desde el año pasado en comprender dentro de un alto grado de incertidumbre eh, cuáles son los posibles escenarios en los que nos vamos a seguir desarrollando en la región. Como ustedes saben, esta región es probablemente como zona geográfica amplia la más afectada por la pandemia por COVID-19 en el mundo y continúa luchando, no solo creando medidas de prevención, como explica Yanir, eh, logrando comprar vacunas y administrándolas a la población, pero también eh, trabajando en una zona de alto desempleo, alto subempleo, crisis fiscales en muchos países de la región que impiden a los gobiernos tener mejores redes de protección social para la población y también eh, históricamente y al momento crisis políticas, crisis de gobernanza en diferentes países de la región. Por ejemplo, Chile y Ecuador, e incluso Perú, poco más tarde, entran a la pandemia después de graves protestas sociales masivas. En, en Brasil actualmente ha habido oleadas también de protestas masivas eh, y dificultad de la comunidad científica llegar 
a la comprensión del de efecto que tienen ciertas decisiones políticas en la respuesta a la pandemia. Y este es el contexto en el cual, como dije, nos reunimos a discutir la evidencia, eh, explorar los posibles escenarios para la región y eh, sobre todo empujar el conocimiento científico para una mejor toma de decisiones y diseños de políticas en lo que queda de este año y el siguiente, porque la transmisión en nuestra región continúa y continúa con fuerza. Gracias. Gracias, Irene. Eh, tal vez, eh, Miguel. Sí, con mucho gusto. Gracias, Tomás. Primero, eh, reconocer el, la intervención de Janer Barjam, la, eh, muy, muy interesante, muy eh, clara su intervención y me parece que con gran eh, mensaje de enseñanza de los países que han optado por eh, la eliminación, como él menciona, del COVID. Creo que eso es eh, de las enseñanzas que uno debe tomar. Eh, eh, y a mi juicio, creo que la primera de las de los puntos para poder avanzar hacia una eliminación del COVID eh, tiene que ver con una voluntad política de los países. Creo que en la medida en que exista la voluntad política para, y real, legítima, para poder eh, llevar a, a cero COVID eh, es sin duda fundamental. Eh, las diferentes maneras de poder llegar a esto pues ya se han expresado muchas veces, yo, muchas, en varias ocasiones, y eh, ya lo hizo también Janer, eh, me parece que no es una sola estrategia, no es la estrategia, no es la estrategia de vacunación, no es, sería la estrategia de eh, movilidad o de cuarentena, eh, me parece que tiene que ver con un grupo de acciones eh, en materia de prevención y promoción a la salud, así como de eh, acciones de, de eh, generar conciencia en, en la población y a veces eh, poner incluso mano dura. Y tenemos muchos ejemplos de ello. Eh, en temas de prevención, creo que eh, a muchos países nos faltó desde un inicio el de veras hacer una, una realidad el, el uso de los cubrebocas o mascarillas, eh, el garantizar este distanciamiento físico y el aseo permanente de, de manos, así como algunos confinamientos eh, expeditos, oportunos, eh, que evitaran la expansión de, del virus, eh, acciones de otra índole más, más proactivas desde las autoridades sanitarias, como la búsqueda intensiva de casos y una vez encontrados los casos, los contactos para poder hacer una especie de eh, de restricciones en su movilidad y de seguimiento eh, continuo, evitando eh, la salida de ellos. Hubo acciones eh, que en algunos países se mencionaba que no era posible hacerlo por un, una, eh, digamos, una componente de derechos humanos como acciones sanitarias digitales, en donde desde los teléfonos móviles había un seguimiento constante de los casos y y restricciones de su movimiento. Eh, asimismo, eh, considero que el seguimiento permanente de los casos y contactos eh, con acciones de prevención eh, es, es fundamental. El monitoreo continuo de, de casos y contactos o portadores, incluso asintomáticos, también es un factor fundamental. Entonces, me parece que la forma para poder eh, llegar a un esquema de eliminación no es únicamente eh, una política pública, la política de vacunación o una política, la política de cuarentena. Me parece que tiene que ser una serie de acciones en su conjunto, pero que estas acciones deben ser instrumentadas con una buena planeación con una buena organización y con un esquema de comunicación a la población para que ellos puedan asimilar y puedan participar y cooperar 
con, con, con estas acciones de, de mitigación y eliminación de la enfermedad. Evidentemente, muchos países eh, se vieron enfrentados a un tema difícil, que era justamente el, la parte económica. Es decir, y bien lo dijo Yaner, había que sacrificar en un principio la parte económica con la finalidad de poder garantizar un rápido control, un expedito, manejo, una rápida eliminación y después generar ya la, la economía en los países. Entonces, me parece que eh, considero que en, en concreto que eh, no es una sola acción, es una serie de acciones en su conjunto, que con voluntad política, con la participación de la comunidad, con la comunicación de los riesgos, eh, es, es, es como podemos llegar a cero COVID. Y es claro, se ha demostrado que sí es factible llegar a esa eliminación de COVID con los claros ejemplos que Janer nos ha puesto de antemano. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Miguel. Ahora eh, voy a darle paso a Ana Stuart Ibarra del Instituto Interamericano para la Investigación del Cambio Global. Eh, a un breve comentario. Y eh, vamos a pasar luego a la sesión, la sección de preguntas. Mm -hmm. After thinking, after hearing Anir's words about the importance of clarity in, in setting a clear intention, and I think that's true throughout all of life, but especially in these moments of crisis, how the power of setting a clear intention and clear goal. Um, that was one thing that I was stuck with. And then the second is what from these experiences Um, are we going to be able to learn and carry forward to deal with the other crises that are all around us, like the climate crisis? We know, similar to COVID, that with climate crises, the most vulnerable populations are at greater risk. The risk is not equally distributed across our population. Actions need to be taken urgently, and yet there are tremendous uncertainties. And so I'm left thinking about what capacities need to be strengthened at the science policy interface so that we are better prepared as a region to face whether it's, you know, this pandemic, the next pandemic, climate crisis. This is, this is not uh, a one-time uh, crisis. Uh, and so how can we build stronger societies, more equal, equitable, and just societies, uh, and to reduce the burden of disease and increase well-being across the region? Those are some thoughts, but I see that we have a number of questions also in the Q&A. And if you have other questions, I would encourage that people to put them in the Q&A. So I'll turn it back to our panelists. Thank you. So I'm, I'm happy to read the questions if you'd like, um, or uh, you can, should I do that? Eh, sí, adelante, Yanir. Hay, tal vez hay, hay dos preguntas relacionadas. Okay. So uh, the first question is about uh, the threshold of one case per million and what is the role of testing capacity in this? Um, India has low cases, but the, maybe their testing capacity is not particularly high. Um, and, and so the point is that once you're down at one case per million, the testing capacity is not that important because you only have a very few cases. They're down to about under 200 cases per day in a population of 225 million. Um, so the testing capacity to identify those cases is available. But the other thing to say is to explain actually how they stop the outbreak. And the answer is they have teams of people, teams of civil society, right? Teams of, of guided by public health um, uh, individuals but involving many different uh, community groups that basically descend on a community and they go door to door and identify cases. It's a very uh, intensive effort. And this can work even in high density areas like in Dharavi, which is one of the major um, uh, 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 slums in Asia where you have a million people in a square mile or you know, a couple of square kilometers of area. And what they do is they go door to door and they don't have enough testing very often if there's a high number of cases. 
So what do you do if there's high number of cases? And the answer is use temperature and oximetry. So you don't use PCR testing to identify cases, but using temperature and oximetry, you isolate and quarantine families based upon those tests. And people understand it. And the reason they understand it is that instead of sending you know, um, uh, outsiders, it's the community members themselves that are involved in providing this uh, screening of the population. So they're trusted people and, and they can um, uh, engage directly with the community uh, and uh, address their concerns uh, rather than sending in somebody else that might be not trusted. The issue of trust in a pandemic, when you're asking people uh, to uh, subject themselves to tests and also to go for isolation and quarantine is critical because you're asking people to leave their homes. And if you do something that people don't trust, well, maybe one person you can force, but the next you cannot force a community and the communities will rebel if they don't trust uh, the people that are doing these things. So, so thinking through that this is really a community action. Public health ultimately, surely in a pandemic, but in many other contexts, is, is a community-based activity. It requires the community members to participate in even more than just agree to. So it's not just about communication to the government, it's communication to the public about the opportunities to achieve elimination and that the goal is really to stop transmission. And the reason why that's a good thing is because it actually doesn't take that long. I, I've been saying since the beginning of the pandemic, you know, a few weeks in, so to speak, when the cases came, it's four to six weeks before we can achieve elimination. So at every point in time during the pandemic, we've basically been four to six weeks away from elimination. And the question is, why can't we do the six weeks? And the answer is because people are worried that what they do during that time will become forever. There's this tendency at the beginning, if you remember before the pandemic hit, everybody was like, no, nothing can happen here. It's in China. My life is not going to be disrupted by this disease because I've never experienced disruption. Once the disease came and people's lives were disrupted, then they believed that that was the way it was gonna be forever. So the idea that there is an opportunity to achieve elimination in a short period of time is super important. Remember, we spoke about the need for investment, but the financial investment in a four to six week period is much smaller than it is if it was a six month period or a 12 month period, which is what we've been doing. So the point is that there is really an opportunity to do a small financial investment, relatively speaking, uh, and not a large one. So um, the second question about the need for lockdowns in Ecuador, Argentina, Colombia, where there isn't income assistance. Well, I, I first of all think that it's extremely important for people to be supported during the time of strong action, call it lockdown, where people are unable to go to normal work, where people are unable to do many things that they would depend upon for their income. And so they should be supported. But there are two things again that are important. One is that it doesn't take all that long. So the point is if you do it halfway, then you can't get there. And the reason you can't get there is because it takes a long time. So it takes a large financial investment. So you can't do it. So you have to not do it. So you stop. And that's why most of the lockdowns in the world have not been effective and have not achieved elimination because they're all halfway because everyone's trying to compromise. Well, you know, maybe we don't have to do this because that will enable these people to get an income and those people to get an income. And, and so let's only do it halfway. But you do it halfway and it takes months and months and months and then you can't finish the process because it's cost so much and it's taken so long. You have to open schools because of parents, because the parents have to go to work uh, and all of those things undermine the ability to achieve elimination. 
So the ability to say, okay, here's the deal. We're going to stop compromising and we're going to put out this fire. We're going to get to zero. We're going to do elimination and then we'll go back to normal. That's super important. But the second thing is at least as important and that's the geographic process. Because the point is that there are many places where one can get to elimination even shorter, like two to three weeks, maybe four weeks. Um, and so doing it in the places that it works easier and faster serves as an example. And knowing that you can do it and go back to normal makes a difference. So if you do it in some places, then you can be convince others that they should do it too. Now, again, there's the example of Canada. And Canada is not the best example of this because we have four provinces that have achieved elimination. And there are other provinces that haven't. So why didn't the other provinces learn? And again, there is a challenge of science communication, these same narratives of it can't be done, even though right next door someone did it. Uh, and even though um, it, they've demonstrated that it's better economically. And the economic analysis is straightforward. And if you haven't seen it, uh, you can go to the COVID Action Group website. Uh, there is an economic analysis that shows how the economic benefits are there. Um, and we wrote an economic analysis a year ago. Uh, but the point is that the experience of seeing it matters. And so what we need to do is to provide very clear scientific understanding about the economic situation which again is not entirely just a public health statement. It's a public health plus economic statement. And there are plenty of economists, there are a couple of economics groups in France that have done very good analysis of the global uh, situation with um, uh, elimination. But there have been multiple studies by consulting groups, uh, by uh, Boston Consulting Group, by, um, by many of the other major consulting groups that have said that elimination is the best strategy, flat out. And there was an analysis by the IMF that said exactly the same thing. So go strong, go uh, uh, fast is the way to achieve the best economic outcomes. And that's what the economists are saying when they do the analysis. So the next question is about restrictions to mobility but not lockdowns can be successful if combined with the vaccines in stopping transmission? Uh, and the answer is kind of almost, but not quite. So of course, it very much also depends on nowadays on the variant. So maybe with the original variant, with just um, uh, travel restrictions plus vaccination, and then the question is what percentage of vaccination, right? So at high vaccination levels, you know, um, can you do it? 80%? Maybe. Uh, with the Delta variant, very unlikely. So the point is that rather than asking, can I do it with these policies? What we need to do is make the decision that we want elimination. And then we adjust the policies so that we can achieve elimination. And again, the best strategy is just the fastest. But if you can't convince the politicians to do a 100% you know, lockdown with financial support for people, um, then you can ease off if you have high vaccination um, from that model and you can still achieve elimination as has been demonstrated in Eastern Europe uh, with their mixed policy of vaccinations, partial vaccination plus partial lockdowns. But you have to have as your goal, um, that you're going to get to elimination, or at least you're going to get to rapid cases declining. And in Israel, they never actually had a goal of elimination, but they did have a goal that cases would keep going down. And it took them several months instead of four to six weeks. Uh, but because they had that goal, they maintained masking indoors. They had still restrictions in how kids went to schools. They had a vaccine passport so that the people who went indoors in stores where only the people were vaccinated, so they have lower transmission risk. Um, so they had a whole bunch of policies that were not, you know, just, you know, hey, everyone can do anything that they want. And now when they eliminated most of the restrictions, that's when they have the Delta outbreak. And now they've reinstated masking indoors. They're tightening their travel restrictions. 
Uh, and it's pretty clear that they're taking the Delta outbreak quite seriously. Now the question is, what will they do to accomplish elimination? And we don't yet know that because they're still in the middle of controlling that outbreak. Um, so um, I think I've answered that question. So mobility is super important. Let me again say, we do not have to start with a goal of achieving elimination everywhere. We only have to achieve elimination in some locality. And again, in multiple countries, there are regions that have had very low cases. There is Formosa in Argentina has had very few cases relative to other uh, provinces. Um, and so there are opportunities to do low cases in some places. And if elimination can be achieved in those places with some additional um, uh, measures, including whether it's vaccination or including whether it's uh, restrictions uh, um, like masking, um, then uh, and combining them with the travel restrictions that prevent importing of cases, then it serves as a model. Uh, and the idea is not to just do it in one case, place, but to use that as a method for communicating about the opportunity to spread. Because if you just have it in one place over time, just like now in Australia and, and, and Taiwan and, and Vietnam, there's going to be a, an outbreak. The, the question is maintaining the zero fire policy. It becomes very difficult if you're neighboring uh, other places that have outbreaks. So what you want to do is to keep moving the boundary uh, so that the areas that have cases continue to decrease. So now how can we explain the sinusoidal behavior and number of infected people, but not exponential behavior in countries lifting restrictions? So I, the, the answer is, I do not, if, if someone wants to point to me where there haven't been uh, uh, effective restrictions, one of the situations is that it's not always true that what the government says people follow. What we've seen over and over again is that the public are doing restrictions and it's remember the government is listening to two different groups. One is the public and one is the business. And in many countries, in fact, all countries that I know of where they've done polls, the public has been much more in favor of restrictions than the government. And the government almost universally has been a follower in doing restrictions. It happened very widely in the US. So in, in Massachusetts where I am, the Communities stopped, closed down schools before the state closed down schools. And, the, and, and in almost every place, when they did analysis of mobility of population, the mobility went down before the government placed the restrictions. So elected officials are not very good leaders. They're much better at following. And so when the public decides that it wants to stop the outbreak, when it doesn't want people to get sick, when there are a large number of cases, then the cases, the people do things and the cases start going down. But the government supporting that and declaring policies really does help. And if it gets ahead of things, then it enables a much stronger action where the public and the government work together uh, in the process of elimination. So uh, understanding how the dynamics of the, of the cases goes, we have to look not just at what the government official policy is, but really what people are doing. And we've seen that you know, in states like North Dakota and the United States, uh, where you know, for a long time they said, no, we're not gonna do restrictions. And eventually people saw how many people got sick and how many people died. And they said, okay, we're gonna start wearing masks. And then the governor said, okay, Let's all wear masks. I hope that addresses the question. Tenemos una pregunta más de Jairo Ramos. Jairo nos pregunta si qué nos nos está preguntando aquí qué hacer y cómo abordar el tercer este tercer pico de infestación. Esa es la pregunta. Yanir o alguno de los otros panelistas. Bueno, este, Yanir me, me completará con toda seguridad, pero 
eh, creo que es, estamos viendo ese tercer pico en países que pues no, no hemos entendido la lección o no se ha entendido la lección, no se ha entendido la importancia de estas, mantener las restricciones temporales, eh, cuatro o seis semanas, eh, no se ha entendido la importancia de eh, poder mantener eh, las medidas de prevención, pero no solo eso, sino que se han agregado algunos riesgos adicionales. Y tenemos el claro ejemplo de nuestros hermanos colombianos, en donde adicional a los casos que se estaban presentando, vinieron una serie de políticas públicas que generaron eh, pues, respuesta de la población, eh, salida de la población para manifestaciones, para manifestarse, para defender. Y eso lo que generó en ese país pues, fue un mayor acúmulo de susceptibles, un mayor eh, acercamiento social. Eh, la gente con su enojo, con su manifestación, eh, se restringía de la protección, no usaba cubrebocas, este, estaban muy cercanos unos con otros. Eh, estas eh, incluso eh, divisiones con la, con la misma policía, la acción de la policía. Y estas eh, acciones pues eh, poco permiten el poder restringir eh, 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 la reducción de los casos, menos la eliminación. Y también eh, algunos gobiernos que eh, por razones eh, diversas, económicas, algunas de ellas, no suspendían y no, eh, maneja, no, no, no evitaban eventos públicos. Y entonces eso generaba pues, un acercamiento de nuevo de la población y lo digo en sobre todo los países en donde el control no se había dado por completo. Entonces, de nuevo, y donde las poli la, la vacunación iba en un 10 o 15 por ciento, o sea, había demasiados factores que estaban generando y que estaban anunciando prácticamente la presencia de una tercera ola. Pero, Yanir, por favor, eh, tú, tú tendrás también mejores comentarios. Gracias. The question was about the Delta variant. I didn't hear the answer. Should I add a few words? Um, so the challenge with the Delta variant is that it makes things much worse. It really accelerates the transmission. It really uh, breaks through a vaccine. So it reduces the vaccine effectiveness by about a factor of two, the best vaccines. Uh, and others as well. So um, what it means is that we end up with more cases, more transmission, and we end up with people being reinfected who were already infected before. And they, of course, are more vulnerable um, and can be, um, and so uh, that's a really bad situation. But ultimately, the situation with the Delta variant is in some sense very similar to the other variants in the sense that if we don't have people getting together in particular getting together indoors with each other um, or um, uh, if they absolutely have to be indoors only for a short time and only with masks and with other precautions, um, then we still can stop the transmission, but it makes it much, much harder. So the key is to go all out. There is no solution to this pandemic without realizing that you actually have to do everything that you can to stop this. And it's not just one person, it's really a community effort that has to happen. So the Delta variant again, puts us back into the situation where even with vaccines, we have to take quite strong action. Um, and uh, without the vaccines, it's pretty clearly extremely difficult to stop the Delta outbreak. Um, It still may be possible, um, and we're seeing the effort to do so in Australia now, um, and uh, hopefully they will be successful, and also in Israel, but Israel has the vaccination. But Australia is trying very hard to stop it, even without high levels of vaccines, uh, and hopefully they will be successful. We'll see how soon. Gracias, Yanir. Yo tengo una pregunta para Yanir. 
Eh, hablaste sobre los datos estadísticos, que no solo los datos estadísticos son los que nos permiten tomar decisiones. Tenemos también que comprender qué recursos tenemos. Pero en nuestros países, eh, a pesar de que tenemos pocas pruebas, los gobiernos sí se basan en estos datos, aunque limitados, para tomar decisiones. Entonces, ¿cómo se puede guiar un gobierno local o nacional para tomar decisiones con el público, como dices tú, con la gente? So, I, I think the, the problem that policymakers have, or several problems that they have, includes um, that they don't feel that the public may follow their instructions. They're, they may be afraid of it. Um, they may also feel that uh, if they adopted a policy before, changing their policy uh, may undermine their uh, the belief in their ability to do things uh, and their uh, role as leaders. So um, there are multiple things that need to be done in order to, number one, um, show them that it's not just that there are places that achieved elimination, but that there are places that have shown how the public communication can be done. And in order to do that, I think it's super important to have policymakers communicate directly with places that have been successful, with the policy leaders that were engaged in the effort of public communication. Because in those places, it has been standard for the policymakers to stand up every day and to reiterate the goal, to uh, uh, track the progress, Uh, and to uh, um, model for citizens uh, in their words and of course in their deeds what needs to be done in order to achieve elimination. That's one part of it. The recognition and the, um, and the communication about the process of communicating to the public is super important. The other parts of it have to do with uh, leaders Um, being willing to take a risk and be understanding that what's happened in those places where elimination has been achieved is that leaders have been wildly supported by the public. That there really has been enthusiastic response about the success of elimination, so much so that there have been landslide victories in multiple states in Australia and in Shirley and New Zealand uh, of the parties that have been the ones that have uh, been the leaders during the time of achieving elimination. So the fact that the leaders can, um, can be, um, uh, achieve success politically, not just against the disease is again important. So the success economically, uh, health success, the success politically, the success economically are all linked through the mechanism of achieving, of doing strong action and achieving elimination. And again, it's not so simple, right? Because where there are places where there is perpetual semi-lockdowns and yo-yo restriction, over time, the public becomes disillusioned with the leaders. So they do lockdowns and the public doesn't believe in them because then they open up and then there is need for another lockdown. And so the fact that there has been a loss of, of belief by the public uh, comes in this context of these yo-yo lockdowns. But the ability to uh, articulate a goal and the ability to uh, stick with the process of elimination past the point where it seems like there are very few cases, the most difficult time in achieving elimination is not when the cases are high, Because at that point, the leaders are basically forced to take strong action. And the public is doing it even if the leaders don't. The biggest challenge is at the end of the process, 
is when the cases are low, when the politician has to stand up and say, we're not there yet. And we really need to get to zero, even though there's one case per million, we can't just relax restrictions. We need another week or whatever it is, or two in order to achieve elimination. And the reason why that's so hard is that everyone says, look, there's only one case per million. The chances of me getting infected are small. But then all you need is one person to be infected more per day, you know, in a population of a million, and then the cases will grow exponentially. So the psychological context at the end has to be very clearly articulated. One has to say, look, we've done this work to get near zero, but the difference between zero and any other number matters. And so we're going to get all the way to zero and then we're going to be able to open up. We have to hang in there and that communication is the most important and most difficult and most critical communication to the public about elimination. Gracias, Yanir. Y muchísimas gracias a todas las personas que se unieron a este evento. Eh, agradecemos a los panelistas, a la doctora Irene Torres, a, al doctor Miguel Lombera, a la doctora Ana Stewart y al doctor Yanir Baryam. Muchísimas gracias a todos por unirse a esta discusión tan enriquecedora y ojalá que haya sido de mucho provecho y que podamos continuar esta discusión sobre cuál es la mejor estrategia eh, para acabar con, con eh, la COVID-19. Y eh, también agradecemos a las organizaciones eh, organizadoras de este evento, al Instituto Interamericano para la Investigación del Cambio Global y la Alianza de Asociaciones de Salud Pública de las Américas y a todos ustedes por unirse, por tomar un tiempo eh, el, su tiempo esta tarde para unirse a esta discusión. Eh, con esto hemos concluido el evento de hoy y eh, muchísimas gracias a todos por unirse. Gracias, gracias Thank Yanir. You. Gracias a todos y todas. Gracias, gracias. Muchas gracias.